Operator 12515, how may I help you? One moment, please, while I find that number. Long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, people would call directory assistance by dialing 411 in order to find a phone number. In 1980, I was a directory assistance operator. I would help people who called me make connections with other people. I did this to raise money for college, and I learned a lot of things. We could only say seven stock phrases. If it got beyond that, we would be in trouble. So I could say things like, what city, please? Or, is that D, as in David? Heavy stuff. <laughs> I also learned two important lessons that I carried out of that experience as an operator. I learned that when people can't see you, they feel very comfortable pretty much saying anything they want. Anything. Especially in the middle of the night. And I also learned that oftentimes they didn't call for information. They called for conversation. And that's all they wanted from me. The second thing that I learned as a directory assistance operator was to really depend on my imagination. And I had a pretty vivid imagination. I would hear a voice, I would listen to the tone, and I would take in what they were asking me as an operator and begin to imagine what they might be like. And one of the criteria for my imagination was, are they normal or not? Because being normal was very important to me at the time. I was 19, I was right out of high school, and I wanted to be normal, like this. This is my senior high school picture. This is what I looked like as a directory assistance operator. And being normal was very, very important to me. I idolized everything about being normal. So once, in the middle of the night, I receive a call, and my imagination begins to run wild because there was nothing normal about this phone call. The moment the man got on the phone. I could tell he was very distressed. He was very anxious. The first thing he said was, don't hang up. No matter what you do, don't hang up. Hear me out. I wanted to hang up right then and there. <laughs> but something in his voice kind of got through to me, and I wanted to find out what was wrong. I wanted to find out if I could help him, but I also imagined what it must be like for him to be calling me in the middle of the night with a very strange request. He said, in 1968, NASA succeeded in landing a man on the moon. And while that man was there, he installed a telephone. And this caller needed that number. <laughs> and he really wanted that number. Inside, I just froze. I thought, this is the craziest thing I have ever heard. This is not normal, and I like normal very much. <laughs> but I couldn't answer him. So I pulled out one of my seven stock phrases because something inside of me felt his distress. He knew I could reject him, and he knew he was not normal, and he had trusted me with his call. So I pulled out one of my seven stock phrases, which later I thought was kind of brilliant, in order to communicate with him, I care even though I can't help you. So what I said was, sir, I am so sorry, but the moon is not in the 713 area code. <laughs> we met in a kind of middle place <laughs> because from the sound of his voice, I could imagine he was relieved that I had not mocked or ridiculed him. I didn't believe there was a phone on the moon, and I didn't believe he was normal, but I believed in his truth. He believed it, and I met him in that space. He accepted my answer because I treated him professionally and not as somebody who seemed troubled. I was 19, and that one call as a directory assistance operator actually shifted something almost physical inside of me. It was a very powerful moment for me. 
I learned that my story and my truth is my story and my truth. But you and I live in worlds that are filled with multiple truths. We live in a time of separation and polarization. We have enlightenment principles that have given us our constitutional government. That's one truth. We have empiricism and science. That's another truth. We have postmodern realities. We have all kinds of truth, relative and subjective, in relationship to one another. Think of it this way. This is how I often imagine it. Think of looking through your lens, the lens of your phone, and you want to take a picture. So you frame it, and that frame is all of your life experiences, all of your truth. So for example, when I was a child, a dog bit my ear and I needed two stitches. So now when I'm walking through Lincoln Park and I see a dog, I see a threat. That's what I see through my lens. Maybe one of you had the best dog in the world who was your friend and was like Lassie and saved you from the well. And so when you see the exact same thing, the same dog, you see your best friend. Another way of looking at this is to use the words from the postmodern philosopher Jean-Luc Marion. He talks about the relationship between our idols and our icons. Now those are traditionally religious symbols, but Marion takes it far, far beyond religion. Again, think of it this way. An idol stands in front of your lens and it demands your attention. You must feed it, you must listen to it, it will tell you what is true, and it will tell you what is false, and it will tell you what is a threat, and it will even tell you what to hate and destroy. The opposite of this is an icon, and we use icons every single day if we use our smartphone or a computer. An icon takes you to another place. It doesn't stand in front of you, it leads you somewhere else. You click on it, and you end up somewhere else. An icon takes you to a new world, a new way of imagining the world. Let me use, as many of my fellow speakers have done, let me use a, a personal experience that may help. I served for one year in New Orleans in the St. Thomas Housing Projects. I was there as part of my training to be a Vincentian priest, and I lived deep in the heart of poverty. When I went into that volunteer year, I dragged along with me an enormous idol. I was going to change the world. I was going to save people from ignorance. I was going to help people out of poverty. I could have been an Avenger. That's how I felt. I was going to go in and just save the world. My job was working with Sister Martha Milner in an elementary school teaching music. Sister Martha was a jazz trumpeter from New Orleans and an amazing talent. During the year I was there, two of the children of our school were murdered by having their throats slit because their mother had failed in a drug drop. Sister Martha arranged a march through the projects. She led us with her trumpet playing a jazzy version of an old hymn called The Lord Hears the Cry of the Poor. And all of us, from kindergarten through eighth grade, faculty and staff, marched through St. Thomas Projects, people hanging out on their balconies, on their porch, and as we sang, they began to sing with us. That was an icon that blew my idol out of the water. I could not save these people. I could not save those children. However, I could stand with them I could stand with these people in their poverty, and I could stand with these people in their pain and suffering. That was an icon that took me to a whole new place. After the march was over, I submitted my application to take final vows as a Vincentian, and the rest is here. <laughs> in Easter of that year, Monique and Dominique asked me to be their godfather. These were two children from our neighborhood, and their family was part of our little community. And they invited me again into their world, not because I could save, not because I could do anything other than love them and listen to them and see the world as they saw the world. An extraordinary experience that completely rocked all of my idols. 
So when I think of icons and idols, I think of icons as a window through which I can see a new world, a reimagined world. When I was in New Orleans, I was changed by those people because they told me their story and they let me walk through the icon into their life. Even that bizarre and strange moon caller was the first time in my life that I actually saw somebody else's reality that was not my own, and I couldn't exactly understand it, but I could listen to it. This is me doing a throw rug impression on the floor of a church. <laughs> I'm lying on the floor of the church with my arms open wide as I say yes to the possibility of what icons will I encounter as I move forward. Me, who idolized being normal, picked probably one of the most abnormal ways of life anyone ever came up with. <laughs> Just ask my family. So I think back to that strange and odd moon caller. That's where it all started. I did not believe in his truth, but I listened closely to his truth. All of us, all of us are icons. Every one of us has a story. Every one of us has the capacity to taking somebody somewhere else. Please stand in your truth. Please stand in your truth. And also listen closely to the truth of others. This is how we reimagine communication in such a polarized, bizarre, and divisive time. We can replace our idols with the beauty of the icons that each of us is. Thank you. <laughs>